Not many things can travel as fast as a shooting star. Human beings are grossly limited that way. But when we take away the shackles that hold our minds at bay, then we begin to ask the question, what if? What if we could travel as fast as a shooting star? About two centuries ago, there was someone who believed they could go as fast as they dared to. They were going to let the chains fall and chase their dreams on whatever journey it took them. But ever so often, our plans just don't fall the way we envision them to. Today's video is about someone special, someone unlike anyone you have ever met, a woman, a woman who was as brave as she was beautiful, dancer, model, skier, and yes, you guessed it, racing queen, a woman long forgotten under the dusty covers of ancient history books. We're talking way before even the resistance. And did I forget to mention that she was French? Here's a woman who was not just unafraid to rub shoulders with the boys. She was an amazing driver who set speed records at a time when it was crazy to see a woman holding a driver's license, let alone competing with men. In her prime, she was earning more money than some of the most successful drivers in the sport of car racing, certainly enough to get herself a yacht. Representing a brand that had twice broken the world record for manufacturing the fastest thing on four tires, her life was a tempestuous journey from the vintage lifestyle of Paris to the cosmopolitan environs of Sao Paulo, Brazil. But with every victory a man or a woman has, there are always people who would like to drag you down below. This is not to say this woman was a saint. She loved the fast life in more ways than one. But when the green fingers of envy finally caught around her, she never did fully recover. What would you give to meet the first woman who won the Grand Prix Feminine, a paragon of doggedness in the face of adversity, and one of the foremost pioneers of women's rights in a world dominated by men? Follow me as we uncover one of the mysteries of the last millennium, Helenice. Right at the time when most of the world were celebrating the turn of the century, Another family in France was celebrating the arrival of its newest member, just 10 days to Christmas. On the 15th of December, 1900, her parents took one look at her pink, chubby cheeks and named her Mariette Hélène de Langle. But as we would discover, she wouldn't keep this name for long. The death of her father, at the early age of 16, led her into the arms of René Carrère, a risque artist who painted nude models. She worked for him for a while, before he encouraged her to take up ballet, a career choice that paid her well enough for her to buy her first car and house. Despite her performance on stage and the positive commendations she drew, she continued to harbor a passion for speed-fueled excitement and the beautiful automobiles that brought them about. Unsurprisingly, one of her lovers at this time was Henri de Courcel, a Grand Prix racing driver who took her on tours to the hottest racing events around Europe. It was sometime during this period she decided to be called Helle Nice. In 1921, Nice attempted to enter a race at Brooklands in England, but she was firmly turned down because she was a woman. In anger, she would turn to skiing as a substitute to fuel her need to go fast, but an injury on the slopes some years later quietly closed that chapter of her life. Again in 1929, Nice returned back to racing, training for and eventually winning the first women's Grand Prix held in the middle of the year. She coasted to victory on the back of an Omega 6, which was personally given to her by the car's manufacturer, Jules Dahlbeck. He believed the photos of a glamorous female champion would help boost the sales of his cars, and rightly so. Later that year, she would drive the Bugatti Type 35C to a world record of 197 kilometers per hour over a 10-kilometer course at Montlhery, earning herself the title, The Queen of Speed. Less than 24 hours after this happened, Nice received a letter from Bugatti, inviting her to drive for the factory. This was the beginning of Helle Nice's meteoric rise to worldwide fame. Nice promptly showed the eagerly watching audience that she was as good as advertised when she won the Actors' Championship in a Bugatti, a feat all the more remarkable because she had competed against men, some of whom had many years of experience under their belt. Next came the sponsorship deal with Lucky Strike, a cigarette company financing the races. Within a short time, thousands of posters appeared featuring her visage. The money she earned was rivaled only by the popularity that came with the deal, 
skyrocketing her to a position among the most influential people in France. As her fame grew, so did her exploits on the track. In 1930, she traveled to America as a paid exhibition driver who drove with her helmet off because the crowd loved to see her hair whipping about in the breeze as she zipped by in bursts of speed. Nice signed another lucrative advertising deal, this time with Esso, and was later crowned the Bugatti Queen by the press. Rich and now famous worldwide, Nice returned to Europe and switched employers from Bugatti to Alfa Romeo, determined to make her mark as a Grand Prix driver. Her desire was rewarded in the season's first Grand Prix when she placed fourth, racing against the sport's best drivers, including Philippe etan Selin, René Dreyfus, and Louis Chiron. Also worthy of note was the fact that Nice's love for powerful machines translated into love for powerful men. Her popularity attracted the interest of the finest, wealthiest, and most powerful men in France and beyond. Some of her more well-known lovers included men like Philippe de Rothschild, Jean Bugatti, Count Bruno de Arcourt, and members of European nobility. But her fortunes would take a sudden downturn for the worse when in 1936, a freak accident on the racetracks almost ended in her death. She'd been competing in the Sao Paulo Grand Prix in Brazil, hot on the heels of Manuel de Tefe, when she realized the spectators had crowded onto the track. In a bid to avoid them, Nice swerved her Alfa Romeo to the side and plowed head-on into a bale of hay. It was a disaster of biblical proportions. The impact sent the car airborne, launching Nice from the driver's seat and resulting in the death of six people while wounding more than 30 others. Nice's fall was cushioned by a soldier in the stands who died on the spot while Nice lay beside him, unconscious. She remained in a coma for three days before she regained consciousness. However, Nice came back to life, a hero of Brazil, making her public appearance two months after she had been assumed to be dead. Unfortunately, this was not enough to convince her bosses that she could race again. They'd heard about the near-fatal head injuries she had sustained in her accident and did not want to risk putting her behind the wheel. When Alfa Romeo refused to race her, Helle Nice went looking for sponsors for the Tripoli Grand Prix in 1937, but no one would touch her, not even with a 10-foot pole. Knowing she had to prove her mettle once again, Nice teamed up with three other women at Montlhery and alternated stints behind the wheel in the Yako Endurance Trials. Together, the women drove for 10 days and nights straight and broke 10 world records. Over the next two years, she drove in rallies, hoping to be signed once more with the Bugatti team. But it was not enough. Then came the wars in 1939 with Germany invading Poland, effectively putting a period to racing in Europe. Still wealthy, Nice moved to the French Riviera to set up with her lover in a sprawling estate overlooking the city of Nice. There she lived lavishly as she was wont to, and unintentionally incurred the ire of one of her former racing rivals. At a party celebrating the first post-war Monte Carlo rally in 1949, Louis Chiron accused Nice of being a Gestapo agent in order to maintain her exotic lifestyle. It was a damaging accusation that has, however, not still been proven until this day. But as is the nature of men, many of whom must have envied her, no proof was needed. Nice became a pariah. Besides, no one thinks about questioning the word of a renowned driver and an influential figure in motorsports against the denials of a woman with questionable morals. Nice became estranged from her family, unemployable. As if that were not enough, her lover tricked her and absconded with all of her money, essentially rendering her penniless. Nice even made an attempt to contact the rally's organization in order to refute the accusation, but he was a friend of Louis Chiron and did not lift a finger to help. Instead, he claimed to be out of the country and unavailable. The final years of Nice's life were a stark and bitter contrast to the enchanted years of her prime. Nice was forced to live on the meager handouts from an actor's charity, the very type of charity she had helped fund during her halcyon years as a showgirl. With her name scrubbed out of the history books, Helle Nice died on October 1, 1984 at the age of 83, an unmarked grave the only evidence she had once walked on this earth.